thank you for coming out. Uh, I, I always have a, a little difficulty thinking about uh, how to begin and uh, why I should expect <coughs> teachers in uh, greater Phoenix or elsewhere to stop and, and think about uh, an event and, uh, that occurred a century ago. Um, for me, World War I is so ancient, and for our students, World War II is ancient as well, and yet uh, somehow we w want to make a, a special case and a special plea to remember uh, a crime against humanity that occurred well over 100 years ago when we well know that in the 20th century, which is our wonderful 20th century, most of us are 20th century people, um, there were probably more than 100 million civilian deaths in that century. And uh, to a century that gave us so much. You know, I look at my own life growing up in Central Valley of California, being the son of survivors of a genocide, first generation born in the United States in the 1930s and 40s. And um, we lived in a, in a farmhouse and uh, my mother did the ha wash by hand. And then I remember a washing machine coming into the house and the wringer that <laughs> we had to do, and uh, all of the, the marvelous things of, of the 20th century that made life so much easier for us. And I remember when I was at UCLA already for many years, I received something from Australia, a letter from Australia that had been sent the first, same day. I couldn't believe it, you know? And it was a fax, and I, I didn't know, I mean, I'd never heard of this before. And now faxes are so antiquated that we don't have any patience to do it, and it's all here, and the world is at our fingertips. And yet with all of this wonderful um, advances that should make us the happiest people in the world, and the generation of young people who have everything and should make them the happiest uh, in the world, uh, we also had a century that created weapons of mass destruction, and, and a century that created belief systems and ideologies of segregating the other and not wanting the other and finding ways to justify the elimination of the other in such much greater proportion than had ever been possible before because of the advances of technology and the misuse of those technologies. So as I was sitting there, I said, what, what am I gonna say? Uh, it came to mind that within the last couple of months, we've had mosques attacked, we've had synagogues attacked, we've had churches attacked, uh, and people who are supposed to be very peaceful, religious peaceful, including Hindus, including uh, Buddhists, militant aspects of them, can take a, a belief system and warp it to such a way that destruction of the other becomes not a bad thing, becomes a good thing, and there are even rewards for it, promise. And I guess that is what I want to say is that the Armenian genocide that occurred this more than a century ago, and it was a precursor to the Holocaust by one generation, probably is not justified to teach, except for the victims it is, in and of itself, uh, without giving it a much broader application and you know for if you're a victim and I'm, and 
I now, um, I, I didn't feel like I was a victim when I was a child. Uh, my grandson wrote this book, Family, Family of Shadows, which is my family. And um, it, it was about coming to America, coming to America by the immigrant survivor who went through unbelievable inferno before getting here, and then, and I think this would work with some of your students, identity issues of young kids born in America or coming to America, of who am I? What do I represent? And I, I went personally to this. You know, I had this long last name. What happens to mean Johnson? Hovannes is Johannes. So I'm John, the son of John, but you know, and I, every so when I was in the third or fourth grade, and the teacher was calling the roll, I always knew when the teacher hesitated that the next name was mine, and, and so you know this causes problems, trauma for for a young kid. I could expect uh, in your own classes from different backgrounds who are wondering uh, who they are. So it seems to me that you know, when we start talking about the Armenian genocide, it can come in at so many different levels as an object lesson. It could come in geography as to what is an empire, why were there empires, how are minority populations treated in empires, um, what is uh, what is domin the dominant group and, and, and the subservient groups, and why do they become dominant, and, and why do they become subservient? Um, and certainly in world history, uh, war in many ways is a cover to settle scores. War was used in World War I, and this is something that needs to be integrated so we can understand it. The scope of it, war was used as a cover to wage an internal war against elements within society that were regarded as alien, even though they may have lived there for a thousand years or two thousand years, but because they were different by their religion or by their uh, race or by their uh, ethnic complexion, even though they had been there, even though they had contributed to society with such great magnitude and in many, so many different ways, culturally, economically, and so forth, Nonetheless, they remained the other, or they became identified as the other. And if there had not been probably a World War I, there may not have been an Armenian genocide. I can't say that for sure. And if there had not been a World War II, there may have not been a Holocaust. There could have been discrimination, they could have done piecemeal things, but would they have the audacity, the purpose? to say this is an opportunity for me to get rid of a problem. You know, in the minds of the Nazis, they had a Jewish problem. And uh, they had taken measures to curb the rights of Jews and intellectuals and members and numbers and people in universities and so on and so forth. But would they have dared, with the entire world watching, to have undertaken a Holocaust at the time? Uh, I don't have the final answer, but I'm doubtful. Uh, that was a desire, as in the case of the Armenians, a Turkish government known as the Young Turks, you know, the Ottoman Empire uh, spread over 
Europe, southeastern Europe, from what today is known as Romania and Greece, all the way eastward uh, to um, Iran, and down to Arab, the Arab areas where Israel and uh, Egypt are today. So it was a big empire. And the leaders uh, of this empire felt uh, that um, there was an Armenian problem. And they had taken certain discriminations. They had conducted certain pogroms and massacres of the Armenians previously. Uh, but would they have decided that they could use World War I as the opportune moment to get rid of this problem of a Christian minority? living in a Muslim empire, dominated by Muslims, <coughs> by Muslim Turks, a Christian minority that might look to Christian Europe to do what other Christian subject peoples have done, like the Greeks, like the Bulgarians, like the Serbs, like the Romanians, and try to separate from the empire. Uh, uh, so, I think what we want also to do is to look at the perpetrators of, and those who commit human rights violations. Uh, who are these people? Uh, why do they feel so insecure? Are they insecure? Why do they want to scapegoat and blame other peoples for their own weaknesses? And in the case of the Turkish Empire, um, it was um, the loss of so much territory in the 19th century, the Turkish Empire shrank a great deal. And usually it was the Christian powers or the, the Christian minorities who were breaking away. And so there was this feeling of, you know, of a threat. Uh, uh, much as the way, whether real, uh, real or uh, imagined, uh, the Germans could feel a threat. They had been through World War I. They had lost enormous territories. There was an economic crisis. There was Bolshevism on the eastern frontier. Uh, Jews were uh, prominent in the communist movement. Uh, so you could always find uh, excuses to say that we, we, we were a threat. Um, as I say, when I was growing up, I, I had this identity you know, crisis, and it took me um, some years to get over it, uh, because I, I, you're, you're too young to know. But it's probably not that much different. 1930s America was very racist, very intolerant of people of color, very intolerant of anyone that was not white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. If you look at the congressional record of the 1920s, you'll find amazing speeches made by senators about the papists. You know what papists are? The Catholics. The Catholics are the threat. <laughs> the Pope is a threat. And uh, so with all of that pressure, it's not unusual that people like myself, not confident about who we are, wanted to not necessarily disguise ourselves, but try to be accepted by that. To, aim to to look like those people. And so you, you know, I went to a Baptist church. I would join various uh, organizations. So uh, that would be, that's it. It took, me, it took some years for me to understand. And what's sort of interesting about my generation, as my grandson will point out, is, it, and that's not true everywhere. Maybe it was my personal experience. Is that Children of survivors don't necessarily want to share 
the experience of their parents. Um, I, I knew my father had been through very bad times. Uh, I knew, um, although he never spoke about his experience, that in his sleep, only in his sleep, that's the only time, he would call his mother's name. His mother, uh, who had been put on the death caravans, you know, each genocide is different. They're similar, but they're different. And in the Armenian case, um, the means of death was uh, primarily through marching people for weeks and deaths, and these are the women and children for the most part, but marching them for weeks into the desert. Uh, we've now had enough TV coverage that you know what the Syrian desert looks like, right? You've seen the desert. And these people who were never told where they were going and why they were going, because deception is a part of genocide. You deceive the victims. You know, it's a temporary relocation. You're gonna go for a while, you'll be okay, you're gonna come back, don't, don't rock the boat. Well, after a while, they know what's happening, of course, when they see everybody dying. I mean, my, I wouldn't last two days uh, walking under the Phoenix sun with uh, inadequate uh, food and water and so forth. I mean, I, uh, people like me sit on, you know, they just, they just go or they're bayoneted if, they're, if they lag. And so the only people are gonna make it 800 miles away or 1,000 miles away are the young women your age, young mothers, who, uh, who are going to face uh, all the uh, infamies of, uh, along the way that happens to young women in times of crisis and genocide. Um, so his mother and two-year-old brother were uh, on the death march. His father, like all the other men, had already been separated and taken away and killed. Uh, again, you know, it's one of these questions that we can put to our students. Why do you think that if the intent is destroy in whole or in part, that's what the Genocide Convention says, uh, why, why do we have this different treatment of just take the men out and bayonet them and shoot them and kill them? usually within a day or two of their home villages, and then why do you take the women and children and march them uh, 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 until unspeakable deaths? Maybe that's something to do with medieval chivalry. You know, macho, but we don't kill women, we don't kill children, we just find a way to get rid of them. And what better way than doing that, or of absorbing them you know, every genocide is different. In the case of the Holocaust, and I'm sorry I'm going back to the Holocaust so much, but there is because there's so much overlap. And probably you're more familiar with the Holocaust than you are of the, of, of the Armenian genocide. I mean, the Armenian genocide has been denied for 100 years, and memory of it has been suppressed. And big governments, including the United States government, collaborate in that suppression. We might ask why. Um, but in, in the case of the Holocaust, the perpetrators, because of their racial ideology, really didn't welcome the absorption of Jewish children into the German master race. But in the Turkish case, these perpetrators their intent was to create something new. And that was by taking a multinational country, multilingual, multi-religious, multicultural, and by force homogenizing it into a single society based on one language, one religion, and one now, you did that by killing people for the most part, but that was not the only way. 
you also took their women and their children and you changed their identities forcibly. Now this, this is something that, that when you compare, the Nazis didn't want to do because that would contaminate them. Whereas for the Turks, it was creating their ideal, the young Turks, this government of the, of the Ottoman Empire, but was creating this ideal society of a single. And the absorption of these people was quite acceptable. Uh, so long as they changed their names, uh, uh, changed their religion, uh, changed their language, uh, uh, etc. So uh, Kaspar's uh, mother, uh, whose name was Helen, or Hernan, and his little brother, Gabriel, uh, were on the death marches with him, and it was just serendipity that the raiding, you know, the tribesmen would raid the caravans every day to see if they could find some gold, some money, something, take away clothing, uh, rape the women, they were, you know, uh, abduct pretty girls, take them away on horseback. Uh, and they saw my, my father, Kasper, Kaspar, um, who was then just between adolescence and young manhood, probably 13 years old, hadn't been taken away with the older men and killed, uh, and was with the deportation caravan. So the tribesmen come down, they see this young boy, and they say, well, he looks good, good labor for us. Because the tribesmen have herds of goats and sheep. They, they need domestic help and, and, and pasture boys. So they took my father from um, his mother and his brother. And maybe uh, by that time, I don't know, we're guessing, um, the mother had resigned herself that maybe it's better that Casper go. Maybe he has a chance to live because she went on and nobody ever knew what happened to these people. We had a lot of stories of survivors who came and told us some things, what happened and how the, where the last place was. And usually it was the two or three year old boy that would die first. And ultimately it was the mother also who died, if not by the bayonet, by starvation, by disease, dysentery, and many other things. And so it's only because, you know, uh, talking about intervention, and that's another thing we can talk about when we talk about human rights as intervention. Who is it that intervenes and why do they intervene? And it's certainly not always because of altruistic humanitarian motives, but there's a profit motive as well. And, uh, and so they intervene to take Casper away to become a shepherd. And, you know, almost miraculously, he survived through the end of World War I, which came in 1918, and somehow found his way to America. Uh, in 1920, he came, I think someone sent him $25 or $30, and he was able to get to Ellis Island. And when they asked him, what is your last name? Uh, he didn't give our traditional family name, but he thought of his father whom he had not seen, of course, for several years, and who had died. And so he uh, told them he gave his father's first name as his last name. And that's why we became Hovanesia, son of John, because his father's name was John. My grandfather's name was John Hovanes, and that's where we became uh, John. Uh, when uh, I began to consider the phenomenon of genocide. You know, we didn't do that for a long time. This whole idea of human rights in a curriculum is not, a new, not an old thing. We're, we're, we're dealing that now in a way that we haven't done before. We talk about human rights in, in civics classes and history classes and other kinds of uh, courses, and that's, that's good. But it's interesting that when uh, genocide studies sort of came into its own, and that didn't happen right away after the Holocaust either. It took a, quite a while. 
for that to happen, and, and probably after, there was a, a Nazi war criminal by the name of Adolf Eichmann. I don't know if you know the name Eichmann, yeah. Uh, the Israeli Masada kidnapped him from Argentina and took him back to Israel and tried him and executed him uh, for crimes against humanity. And uh, that started a certain interest and a legitimization, even among Israeli scholars. So, you know, the Israelis have this attitude, we don't want to be portrayed as victims all the time. We want to be, you know, and that's why they stress resistance so much. They resisted this, the Warsaw Uprising, and so on and so forth. But it became gradually more and more acceptable. And in those years, by in, in those years, I was already at UCLA and already uh, talking about what went on to the Armenians. I had already found my identity, if you will. I had already become learned to speak uh, and read and write Armenian, which I didn't do as a child. Um, but still, I could only essentialize in the way perhaps uh, the survivors did. Essentializing that saying that, like generically the, the perpetrators of Turks are bad people. Generically, historically, uh, they've always murdered, they've always looted, they've always, and there was no contextualization. And, and that's what we grew up on. You know, we have a knee jerk reaction when you say the word Turk as a, child of a survivor, you get a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, you know, they, they, they. And that, that has been enforced by the continuous denial by successive governments in Turkey of acceptance, of acknowledgement, of recognition of what went on. And if you're a victim of a crime, whether it's a personal crime or a collective crime, you, you sort of remain crazy unless it's resolved. And until it's resolved, you, you know, this is the whole other issue is what are the effects, the long-term effects of human rights violations that are not acknowledged or righted? And we've had, you know, as you say, up to the present day, the, uh, this is occurring. But probably no government has been so intense and so insistent on denial as the Turkish government. And probably there are reasons for it. There are reasons for it. Certainly economic reasons, because in any genocide, they <coughs> huge transfer of wealth from the victim group to the perpetrator group. It happens in all genocides. Even go down to Rwanda in the 1990s. I mean, huge flocks of cattle went from one group to another group. It happens everywhere. And uh, if it's never righted, uh, the victims are going to feel like they remain victims. And that's going to pass on to some of their children. And uh, it creates an unhealthy, an unhealthy uh, atmosphere for living. So I suppose, and I, I just want to wrap up. I, what I want to say is that um, in a very busy curriculum, where we can never complete everything at the end of a year. You're coming toward the end of the year and you still haven't done a quarter of the things you were supposed to do. I know. But somehow and somewhere within these different class um, levels, whether it be world geography or world history, civics, public speaking, whatever it may be, there, there's room to integrate this kind of thinking to make our students today aware of such matters and that 
it matters to them because it is also their lives that are in question when we find that someone who is different by color of skin, by language, by religion, by culture, if those people are not embraced uh, and become the other, uh, then they're potential victims. And we're all now potential victims. People are afraid in our society today to go where there are large crowds because you don't know what cuckoos are going to be out there. And again, my generation is a you know, we didn't think that way. On our, in our farmhouse, we went to bed at night with the screen door open. No one would think that something was going to happen. And now we are afraid to do that. So there's something that needs to be worked out. A part of, um, and I'd rather you ask the questions, but I, I do want to show, I don't know how many of you are staying, I'm gonna speak again at six to probably a community. But uh, one of the things I've done over the years is to um, do oral histories of survivors. And uh, I'm now working with the Shoah Foundation in Los Angeles, which is primarily with Holocaust survivors, but also Rwanda. Now they're going out to Cambodia and to Nanjing massacres in China. And I want to show you just two little clips. Uh, one of them says, um, Jirair Iskandarian, uh, who was a little boy uh, when the genocide occurred, and he's living in Australia now, and he's talking about his life. And, and the second one is Elise Hagopian Taft, who actually wrote a book. I don't know if there's someone back there, but just those two clips of, um, of Jirai, J-I-R, 